Gospels, in the Kanji, 13th chapter, 80 myriads of millions of Nayutas of Bodhisattvas vow to spread the Buddha's teachings throughout the worlds in the ten directions and ask for his protection. And at the beginning of the Yujutsu chapter, great Bodhisattvas, fa- great Bodhisattvas from other worlds, numbering as many as the sands of eight Ganges rivers, vow to spread the teachings of Buddhism in this Saha world after the Buddha's passing. However, Shakyamuni answers the multitude of great bodhisattvas saying, Desist, men of good faith. There is no need for you to uphold the scripture. In response, a great multitude of bodhisattvas of the earth, equal in number to the sands of 60,000 Ganges rivers, emerge from within the earth. The four bodhisattvas, Jogyo, Mohengyo, Jogyo, and Anrungyo, as leaders appear at the head of an assembly of countless bodhisattvas. This story, I, I, speaking personally, I find it so exciting. So, of course, it was <coughs> Mr. Toto's great experience in prison, those of you who read The Human Revolution, to come to the realization that he was a Bodhisattva of the air. Now, we get that told us from the very moment we start practicing. One has to remember in Mr. Toto's time, there was no guidance in writing. There was no published volume of the Gosho. There was no interpretation or commentary on the Lotus Sutra. Those were the early days. We are so spoiled now, in a way. So one perhaps could say, you know, how on earth did it take Mr. Toda so long, you know, to discover this? But he had never any means to discover it. Then he went to prison, and as the story goes, he asked for a book to occupy his mind when he wasn't chanting. And the book that came was the Lotus Sutra. And he sent it away again. He said, I don't want the Lotus Sutra. Difficult thing to read. Not the sort of thing you read to take your mind off your miserable conditions in prison. Incredibly difficult to understand. And in a way, seemingly very remote. So he asked them to take the book away. And blow me down, it came back again. And he kept on sending it away, and it always came back to him, until in the end he made up his mind that he'd better just start to grapple with this very difficult sutra. And uh, it was during the process of that grappling, grappling, reading part of the sutra, then chanting Daimoku, then reading, then chanting, that this great realization came to him, that of course he must be a bodhisattva of the earth. And then you remember he also grappled with what are known as the 34 negatives, 34 negatives, neither square nor round, nor standing up, nor sitting down. And at first you think, you know, what is all this? It sounds like a joke. And he pondered and pondered and chanted with his juzu made out of a piece of string and milk bottle tops. He chanted and chanted 10,000 daimoku at least a day. Until in the end, he realized, of course, that the 34 negatives are talking about that intangible thing called life. And what this Buddhism was all about was life itself, his life, and the life of the whole universe. And uh, the law, which is the heart or essence of every living thing. So what a moment it must have been. It's very graphically shown in the film of the human revolution, which unfortunately uh, hasn't got the copyright to allow it to be spread worldwide, which is a great pity. Um, So it's rarely that we see it, though they did smuggle a copy into Treads. So if you're ever at (laughs) Treads, if you're ever at Treads, you could ask to see it. Uh, But it's, I think, wonderfully well portrayed, considering it was done by a commercial company, uh, and indeed actors and actresses and so on, who were not uh, practicing the Chinese Chinese Buddhism. So, uh, Shakyamuni, turns to all these other bodhisattvas who stand up and says, desist, men of good faith, there is no need for you to uphold this scripture, and actually goes on to say to them, you know, you really haven't got the qualities necessary to spread the true teachings in the evil age of Mapa, which is the age that we all live in now, the beginning of the latter day of the law. And he said, you know, as he said that, then all these other bodhisattvas appeared out of the ground. And they, the point is, that although this is an allegory, this is Shakyamuni's way of describing the spread and development of Buddhism in the future, but nevertheless, although it was an allegory used by the Buddha to explain the 
future in terms of what we call the ceremony of the air and the treasure tower and so on. We were there, each one of us. And every time we do Gongyo, we're there again. Because Nichiren Daishonin said, didn't he, when he inscribed the Gohonzo, that it was an exact representation of the, the treasure tower and the ceremony in the air. In other words, he said, as exact as the print matches the woodblock. So every time we sit in front of the Gohonzo, <coughs> reciting the Jurio chapter, doing Gongyo, we are actually reenacting every day the ceremony in the air. And Gicho's hot air balloon, of course, is the treasure tower. The treasure tower, which in the Gosho, Nichiren Daishonin explains, actually represents each one of our lives. Each of us is the treasure tower. He said to a Butsubo, didn't he? The Gosho called on the treasure tower. The Butsubo is the treasure tower. The treasure tower is a Butsubo. So each one of us actually is the treasure tower. Each one of us has within us the Buddha of wisdom, Shakyamuni, and the Buddha called Taho, who re represents uh, the benefit and good fortune that can be drawn from outside us towards us through the workings of our Buddha state. And all the other attributes, all those glittering gems, this is our life. So in Gongyo, we, we can gradually, each day, get a glimpse of this because we feel uplifted if we do a great Gongyo. And the more, in my experience, the more years we go on doing Gongyo, the more that uplifting occurs very rapidly until, you know, you really long to do Gongyo every day. So this experience uh, is a daily occurrence for us. And this helps more and more, of course, to open our lives, as I was saying earlier, to open up our minds to the fact, you know, that it's true. You know, we are Buddhas. Buddhahood exists in us. At the same time, we are Bodhisattvas of the earth. So perhaps when we did this gongyo before this, this afternoon this began, it was an incredible gongyo. The young men had all heard this first. Maybe they were feeling it. I hope, too, when you do Gongyo today, if you haven't already done it, that you feel it, too. And from then on, every day, that incredible Gohonzo, you know, which is the treasure town, is actually nothing else but a mirror of your life. If you can only, through working away at it, day after day, year after year, open your mind, Mind is the enemy, isn't it? Okay, Sandra. I would like to point out here that the character Gyo, meaning practice, is included in the name of each of these four bodhisattvas. Gyo means behavior, not theory. In Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, Gyo, or practice, is most essential. Without practice, one could not say he was embracing the Buddhism of Nichiren Daishonin, and there could be no hope for widespread propagation in the future. The character Gyo is also part of the word Gongyo, the practice which we carry out every morning and evening. Here it means to practice the law assiduously, or on further reflection, the Gyo in Gongyo can also be taken to mean practicing unremittingly. I think it is correct to understand the character Gyo to indicate the attitude of maintaining a steady practice of Gongyo. Now the whole assembly is very surprised to see the emergence of the Bodhisattvas of the earth. Representing the multitude, Bodhisattva Miroku explains that though he has come to this Saha world many times and been born in countless worlds in the other directions and possesses knowledge about all things, these great Bodhisattvas are a mystery to him. He asks Shakyamuni to explain who they are and his relationship to them. In response, Shakyamuni clarifies that the Bodhisattvas of the earth are his original disciples, saying, I have taught these people since the remotest past. Thank you. So the story goes on, and uh, here Miroku says in this story of the ceremony in the air that he has come to this Saha world many times and been born in countless worlds in other directions. In other words, 
first point we can gain from that is that we haven't only lived our many lifetimes on this planet. Of course not. Even this planet has a beginning and an end. It has a cycle of life, right? So in the eternity of our life, we've been born in many planets. Buddhism is, has always said that life or the Buddha's land, you know, that there are many of them throughout the boundless universe. So sometimes uh, new members say, well, if life is eternal and we're constantly being reborn, how is it that the numbers of the Bodhisattvas of the earth keeps on increasing all the time? But of course the answer is that we're not only born in this planet, but also in other Buddha's lands, where Nichiren and Daishonin also appeared at the appropriate time. In other words, there is a former, a middle, and a latter day of the law in all planets where hum human life or something absolutely similar to human life exists. And in all such planets, the true or original Buddha must appear and declare the existence of the law of life, which we call nam myoho renge -kyo. This is part of the rhythm of life. So we may have been in many, many Buddha's lands, and we certainly have been in the past. Saha world means a world in which there are sufferings. That's the meaning of Saha world. A world where there are sufferings. In fact, uh, at the beginning of the, a, the latter day of the law is this period called Mapa, isn't it? Which is when human beings suffer the most. So probably you've heard me say it. This is because Buddhism points out that not the beginning of Mapo is the time when this world enters uh, the latter half of its life. Up to that time, if you like, it's been new, but gradually coming to middle age. The latter day of the law begins when the middle age has been reached and it begins to enter what are known in Buddhism as the eons of decline in the cycle of life of this planet. So the true Buddha must appear in order to activate the life force of the people as the planet gets older. So in the first half of its life, the planet is more like a very young person, full of natural life force. But as it enters its ends of decline, so that life force which was natural to it becomes exhausted and in addition the planet itself is getting older. Therefore more life force must be generated in order to keep the planet functioning and the people on it happy uh, until it finally of course explodes and diffuses into the universe at the conclusion of its life in billions and billions and billions of years time. So the true Buddha is the catalyst for the activation of life force which is so crucial for life to be valuable, creative, and happy, isn't it? All right, Sandra? This revelation virtually repudiates the view that he had first attained enlightenment in India and reveals that he had actually become enlightened in the remote past. This is what is known as the concise statement of opening the near and revealing the distant. At this, however, the assembly becomes all the more confounded, a Miroko al Shakamuni saying, since you attained enlightenment, but 40 years have passed. How in this short time could you have instructed this many noble disciples? This exchange illustrates the Buddhist principle to weaken attachments by arousing doubt. In other words, Shakyamuni caused doubt in the minds of the assembly so as to weaken their attachment to the belief that he had first attained enlightenment in Bodhgaya beneath a body tree. In response to their questions, Shakyamuni expounds the, fo the following Juryo chapter. Here explaining that he attained Buddhahood in the remote past of Goyakujin Tengo, he correctly reveals his original enlightenment. This is referred to as the expanded statement of opening the near and revealing the distant. It is in the Jinriki chapter that Shakyamuni entrusts the Bodhisattvas of the earth, led by Bodhisattva Jogyo, with the propagation of the mystic law in the latter day of the law. 
to entrust here indicates the master transferring the law to his disciples and charging them with the task of ensuring its eternal prosperity. In the Gosho, persecution by sword and staff, the Daishonin states, the Ujitsu chapter also explains something about me because it states that Bodhisattva Jogyo and others will appear in the latter day of the law to propagate the five characters of Nam Myoho Rengekyo. I, Nichiren, have appeared earlier than anyone else. How reassuring to think that I will surely be praised by Bodhisattvas equal in number to the sands of 60,000 Ganges rivers. As stated in the line which reads, I, Nichiren, have appeared earlier than anyone else, Nichiren Daishonin was the first was the first to begin chanting Nam Myoho Rengekyo and the one to initiate its propagation. Nam Myoho Rengekyo is the original seed of Buddhahood. Though Tiantai and others chanted Nam Myoho Rengekyo before the Daishonin's advent, their practice was strictly for themselves, Jigyo. It did not include initiating others, Keita. The phrase in the above cited passage which states, I will surely be praised by the Bodhisattvas of the earth, reflects the Daishonin's modesty. He is the incarnation of Bodhisattva Jogyo, the leader of the Bodhisattvas of the earth, because he is the one who is fulfilling the task of propagating the mystic law in the latter day of the law, as pledged by the Yujutsu chapter. However, this is still a shallow understanding of the matter. Okay, I think we'll go on. In the true object of worship, the Daishonin states, now is when the Bodhisattvas of the earth will appear in this country and establish the, establish the supreme object of worship on the earth, which depicts Shakyamuni Buddha of the essential teaching attending the original Buddha. This object of worship has never appeared in India or China. In other words, though in his outward function Nichiren Daishonin acts as the leader of the Bodhisattvas of the earth, who was entrusted with the propagation of the mystic law by Shakyamuni, he is in fact the Buddha of Kuan Ganjo, or time without beginning. It is precisely because he is the original Buddha that he was able to inscribe the object of worship in which Shakyamuni Buddha of the essential teaching is depicted attending him. Concerning the significance of the appearance of the Bodhisattvas of the earth, the Yongi Kudan states, Nichiren and his disciples who chant Nam Myoho Rengekyo are the Bodhisattvas who emerge from the earth. You should not suppose this to refer to any apart from them. Now, in the latter day of the law, Nichiren Daishonin and his disciples are the bodhisattvas who emerged from the earth. There are no followers of the bodhisattvas of the earth apart from us who are striving to accomplish Kozen Rufu. Strictly speaking, bodhisattvas of the earth refers to Nichiren Daishonin. As emissaries of the Daishonin in the present evil latter age, we embrace the mystic law and advance Kozen Rufu. Hence, we are the followers of the bodhisattvas of the earth. Each one of us must have a sense of our great importance, status, and mission in this regard. For this reason, I hope that based on the mystic law and with ever deeper faith, stronger practice, and magna magnanimity, we will protect one another and advance in beautiful unity. Again, there is a well-known passage in the Gosho, the true entity of life, which states, there should be no discrimination among those who propagate the five characters of Myoho Rengekyo in the latter day of the law, be they men or women. Were they not bodhisattvas of the earth, they could not chant the Daimoku. Thank you. So, I hope that that is clear to you. Is it? <laughs> anyway, it's, it certainly will become more and more clear as you read it. But, uh, as you can see, Shakyamuni's place was crucially important to the flow of Buddhism, uh, obviously down through the ages. So Shakyamuni Buddha's task was to prepare the way for the appearance of the true or original Buddha, the Buddha of Kuan Ganjo, Kuan Ganjo meaning time without beginning or ending. It was essential for Shakyamuni to appear in that way so that the Buddha of Kuan Ganjo, when he appeared and declared Nam Myore Kyo, could validate it in relation to the direct flow of Orthodox Buddhism from Shakyamuni Buddha down to his times. This was the important thing. In this way, Nichiren Daishonin not only was able to declare Nam Myore Kyo and inscribe the Gohonzon, but he was able in his writings, in a scholarly way, to validate the truth of what he was teaching in the direct line of Buddhism 
down through the ages. In other words, he could provide documentary proof as well as theoretical and, lit and actual proof because Shakyamuni had appeared and preached the Lotus Sutra. Did you follow? So, in no way are we knocking Shakyamuni. In no way are we denigrating what he did. On the contrary, in reciting the Jurio chapter every day in Gongyo, we are praising what the Buddhas, which of course not only include Shakyamuni, but also Tientai and so on, what they did in order to bring the teachings forward to the point where Nichiren and Daishonin could appear and teach Nam Myoho and inscribe the Gohons. So Shakyamuni Buddha never ever said how we could attain Buddhahood. He said that the word, he talked and predicted the flow of Buddhism, how Buddhism would go forward down through the ages until the appearance of the person he called the great votary of the Lotus Sutra would appear 2,000 years after he died. And he described and predicted all that would happen to that great votary, which of course Nichiren Daishonin fulfilled. And he said in the Lotus Sutra that at that time, in the dreaded age of Mapo, at the beginning of the latter day of the law, this person would appear and teach the great pure law. Out of the chaos, the great pure law would arise, right? But he never ever said what that great pure law was and how we could live in rhythm. So this was the task of the original Buddha, the Buddha, Nichiren uh, Daishonin, who declared that you could live in rhythm with that law through chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And he then inscribed the Gons so that after he died, uh, we could uh, gradually open up our minds to the existence of Buddhahood in our own lives. So this uh, is, of course, important to understand. Uh, there's a sort of thing about fair play in this country and all the rest of it. Some people may feel that we're knocking in some way, or Nishin <coughs> Daishonin was knocking the Shakyamuni Buddha. Not at all. Nishin Daishonin, if you read the Gosho, is constantly praising Shakyamuni Buddha. Indeed, he asked for a little statue made in wood of Shakyamuni Buddha to go into his coffin with him when he died because Shakyamuni Buddha played an essential part in the declaration of the ultimate truth. Do you all follow that? Good. Okay, let's go on. This passage also clarifies how respectworthy are those who devote themselves to Kosen Rufu. It states that there should be no discrimination among men or women. In the world of the mystic law, there is no discrimination on the basis of gender. One must not look down upon other members because of their sex. We must have mutual respect for each other. Again, in the world of faith, there's absolutely no discrimination on the basis of social standing. Regardless of who someone may be, all people are equal before the Daishonin. This is a very important teaching of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism. The passage continues. Only I, Nichiren, at first chanted Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, but then two, three, and a hundred followed, chanting and teaching others. Likewise, propagation will unfold this way in the future. Doesn't this signify emerging from the earth? With this passage engraved in our hearts, we have been struggling for the realization of Kosen Rufu, and to the present, our movement has advanced exactly as it describes. This is a time unprecedented in the history of the world, when friends embracing the true teachings of Nichiren Daishonin are carrying out vigorous activities throughout the country and in all parts of the world. We have achieved this in Japan despite a continual onslaught of malicious accusations. Regarding emerging from the earth in the Gosho teachings recorded by Nikko, Nichiren Daishonin also says, Earth refers to the life of us human beings. Emerging indicates that at a time, sorry, emerging indicates that at the time of Kosen Rufu, all people throughout the world must become votaries of the Lotus Sutra. Just as plants and grasses of all kinds, as well as large trees, are nourished by the earth, life, based on the mystic law, generates infinite value. The term votary of the Lotus Sutra specifically indicates Nichiren Daishonin. 
Generally, however, it refers to all people who are seeking to accomplish Kosen Rufu in accordance with the Daishonin's teaching. This passage indicates that a time will come when the Daishonin's teachings have, be, have been put into practice, a time when Buddhism has been widely spread and people throughout the world recite the Daimoku as votaries of the Lotus Sutra. This will be a time of emerging from the earth in the true sense. I do not think I am alone in sensing that we are now approaching just such a time. I think we can all agree with Sensei there. I feel we really are approaching it. It's become very apparent, even in the last two to three years, hasn't it? That the time really is right, and the people are really seeking this law. So, as you may know, we've had an unbelievable response, for instance, to articles in the newspapers or to radio broadcasts uh, in recent times, which we never, ever experienced before. We've had articles in the press before, but never did we have a particular response from the public, maybe one letter or two letters. But uh, since uh, that rather strange little article appeared in the Sunday Telegraph supplement, I think it was, uh, that has brought something like 500 telephone calls. So amazing, isn't it? All people who are asking to know more about Nichiren Shosho Buddhism. This is incredible change in the space of just two to three years. So it is the time people's hearts are yearning. They're seeking the Buddha without realizing, of course, it consciously. Then somehow they hear something about nam myoho renge and it rings a bell somewhere in their heart, and they desire to find out more. So definitely it's the time, without a shadow of doubt. And uh, equally, of course, it's the time, because it's the time, we have to make even greater efforts to seize that time and use it to the maximum advantage for the future of Kosen Rufu. Now this is an incredible thing, and we're amazingly fortunate, I feel, to be a part of it all, because things get more and more exciting. Okay, Sandra? Next, I would like to talk about the significance of the bodhisattvas of the earth. First, I would like to clarify the difference between bodhisattvas of the theoretical teaching, or bodhisattvas from the other worlds, and the bodhisattvas of the earth. In connection with this, the Gosha, the true object of worship, states, Essentially, the bodhisattvas of the theoretical teaching and the bodhisattvas of the other worlds were not qualified to inherit nam myoho the heart of the Juryo chapter, which only Nichiren has realized. At the dawn of the latter day, evil people who slander the law would fill the land, and so the Buddha rejected their pledge and instead summoned the bodhisattvas of the earth. He entrusted Nam Myoho Rengekyo to them for the salvation of all mankind. So in other words, it is the eternal mission or purpose of the bodhisattvas of the earth to appear at the beginning of the latter day of the law and undertake the task of spreading the true teachings from then onwards, as long as the latter day of the law lasts, which the Lotus Sutra says it does for 10,000 years and on into eternity. This is the specific role or mission in life of those who are born in this particular age. So we've done this many times. It may be for some of us the first time we've done it on this planet, for others of us, we may have lived several lifetimes on this planet and done it before. But if we haven't done it on this planet before, we've definitely done it on many other planets. <coughs> so Sensei describes it in one of his lectures on the true entity of life. It is like we're born into this world, into place where it's all darkness and there are no signboards. Deep in our lives, we know we have to get to the point where the Gonson is, deep, deep down in our lives. But we grope around, probably in the first part of our lives, finding the way, bumping into this, going down a cul-de-sac, battling our way over hills and valleys, no signboards, dark, 
not quite knowing where we're going, but feeling we're going to get somewhere. This is very vivid for me. Perhaps it is also for many of you. But I spent so many years, nearly 50 years of my life, you know, groping my way, but knowing that in the end I was going to find whatever it was that I was looking for, and I didn't know what I was looking for. That's <laughs> a strange situation. But I knew I was going to get there, to that ultimate truth. Although there were no signboards, and I kept on falling down and bumping into things and making a mess of this, and making a mistake there, and so on and so forth. But in the end, I got there, just as you all got there. So your journey wasn't quite so long, but probably it was equally difficult. Now this is the way the Bodhisattvas of the Earth must appear now. We can't, we don't know exactly the direction we have to go, but we feel, in other words, deep in our life, we feel our mission, we feel our goal, though it's almost subconscious, but it's some urge in our life to seek the Buddha, actually. That's why Shakyamuni said, people say, I appear in this world uh, in the court of, uh, to, to uh, help the people overcome their sufferings. But he said, that's not correct. The people call me into this world in order to help them overcome their sufferings. So in other words, it's the yearning in people's hearts that is what took me over all those years finally to the gods and took you also to find the gods the yearning in one's heart which is a subconscious thing most of the time probably sometimes it may be conscious we may be upset and anxious about how to achieve peace in the world whatever but a lot of the time it's unconscious we're groping our way towards that actual goal so uh, we then, of course, begin to realize that we are what we call followers of the Bodhisattvas of the Earth. That's a term of respect. The leader of the Bodhisattvas of the Earth was Jogyo. Right? Jogyo, who in fact, a votary of the Lotus Sutra, in his transient state of life, then revealed his true identity as the original Buddha through declaring his self-enlightenment as to nam myoho renge and the gongs. So, uh, gradually, step by step, we are revealing ourselves, too, as bodhisattvas of the earth. We may have all sorts of different careers in this life. We may be mums, parents, in the end we'll be grandparents. We may be, you know, working in a company or an artist or a school teacher, whatever. But deep below that is our actual fundamental profound purpose which is to spread the great pure law or the true teachings as widely as we can in our lifetime. And of course we discover that through doing that we fulfill ourselves. We get the greatest joy actually from doing that, although at times it takes incredible effort, doesn't it? So uh, when you read on, this is as far as we'll go now. Probably you're all feeling you've heard enough because it's quite deep stuff, this. But when you go on, you'll uh, find there are some paragraphs which follow when you read it, which are difficult to understand because they seem to be calling the Buddha of Khan Ganjo, Shakyamuni at one moment, and Nichiren Dai Shonen at another. Probably you remember those paragraphs. They immediately follow where we got to. But what you must understand is that in terms of Gosho, in terms of what the sensei is saying here, we are concertinering time. Hmm? There was a time when the only known Buddha was Shakyamuni. He was the Buddha, wasn't he? Then to everyone's amazement in the Lotus Sutra, he suddenly said, I didn't attain enlightenment a few years ago under the Bodhi tree. I've been enlightened since Gohyaku Jintengo. So then he was referred to as the Buddha of Kuan Ganjo. Gohyaku Jintengo was so long ago, it means the remotest past, that everyone thought, you know, he, w he must be the true or original Buddha. And this is the way he was referred to. But then, of course, he shocked people again by saying, I too 
practice the Bodhisattva austerities, meaning under some great master. So that threw everyone into more confusion. It meant that he was taught by a great master and that he wasn't the original self-enlightened Buddha. So gradually, Shakyamuni Buddha, of course, was leading people to understand that in due course, beginning of the latter day of the law, someone even greater than he would appear and teach the great pure law which would exist for 10,000 years and on into eternity. This, in other words, he was hinting at must be the Buddha of Kuru Ganja. So we know, however, that Nichiren Daishonin was self-enlightened. No one taught him nam myoho of the Three Great Secret Laws or the Gohons. This was his self-enlightenment. On the contrary, his master, who was the chief priest of the temple where he was educated, actually could never pull himself away from his previous beliefs and actually follow Nichiren Daishonin. So in two or three Gosha, Nichiren Daishonin regrets this deeply, but nevertheless he still honors his master. But he was actually self-enlightened. So he is the ultimate person who can be named the Buddha of Kuan Ganja. Do you see? So it, it's relevant to the, to the time or the teachings. Shakyamuni originally the Buddha. Nobody else knew of anyone other Buddhas. Then uh, as the teachings progressed, he taught the Lotus Sutra, moving out from the theoretical teachings of the Lotus Sutra to the essential teachings of the Lotus Sutra. So he began to make these statements. First of all, that he was the remotest past was a Buddha. So he's referred to as the Buddha of Kuan Ganja. Then uh, later he said he was taught by somebody. So that took Buddhism another stage, in depth, if you like, or profundity, to the point where it becomes clear that Nichiren Daishonin is the true Buddha. And what is more, he appears you know, in countless different worlds in the latter day of the law, in each one of those worlds. And we appear, all of us, to work with him uh, and spread the teachings as followers of the Bodhisattvas of the earth. We are Bodhisattvas of the earth, but in respect to the leader, we say followers. So that is our task in this lifetime. That's why you're all here together today. That's why I said at the beginning, you know, in this amazing web, existence called life. You've all been doing this before. I can't say that you've been members of what was called a new century group before, but probably something similar. Who knows? Because this is our eternal task in life. This is our purpose in life. Those of us who are born in this age. And those of us, and there are millions of them, who will appear in the future out of the earth when their karma is ripe when they've made the causes to uh, find the gods and, and overcome periods when they slandered and so on. And this is why we are born with karma, so that everyone can relate to us, so that everyone can see that we're, well, really quite ordinary human beings. Therefore, they're willing to talk to us about their problems, and we can give them them your religion. Okay, everybody. So uh, we'll look forward now to the next session, month's time, and then we'll begin right in with Buddhism and politics. Okay, thank you for listening patiently.